Monday mornings with Matt and Kevin. These two will debate real life issues from a Catholic perspective every Monday at 9 a.m. Eastern. Make the world Catholic again. Yes, this is the Catholic Family Podcast in Monday mornings with Matt and Kevin. Before we get going, don't forget that Matt and I are not experts of, well, anything except for being super, super cool. Um, if and, you want and advice... Cooking, and, and cooking Italian food, Kevin. Cooking Italian food. I'm an expert. I'm an expert. I, I, just, I, I just cooked a really good goulash, too. So Italian and Hungarian uh. food, you can come to us. <laughs> Otherwise, if you, if you want uh, spiritual advice, go to your priest. If you want <clears throat> medical advice, go to your doctor. If you want political advice, go to your well, six-month-old baby. They'll have about as good as anybody else is going to have. <laughs> And otherwise, uh, come to us for uh, entertainment and a fun time. Uh, we're, we're not going to change the world with our opinions, but we hope that we'll make your Mondays just that much more interesting. And to start today, we're going to talk about, well, something that's been on people's minds for the last two years. And it's something that I've purposely avoided since starting this channel. But I think the good thing is we're, we're at a time now where I don't feel quite as bad about talking about the virus and the issues with the virus because well we're yeah it, it's a bit removed and so Matt and I are going to talk about some comments that uh, Dr. Fauci has made regarding the virus and then I'm going to talk about a Harvard study that just might uh, make you change your mind about well anything you feel about the virus so Matt uh it, Good morning, yes, first of all, or good afternoon. Good morning, good night. And Ed, what what on earth is Fauci saying about the uh, vaccine? Well, yeah, I saw this, Kevin. And as soon as I saw this, and I knew you and I wanted to talk a little bit about COVID and where we're headed in this, uh, you know, 15 days to slow the spread. Um, <laughs> I, I saw this headline and it popped out at me and it was just like, you've got to be kidding me. So I'm going to read it to the audience now. And again, as always, as we did last time, you know, feel free to comment, chime in, include your thoughts in the comment box. But this is from uh, September 6th, so a few days ago now. Um, but Dr. Fauci, America's most revered and respected doctor, took to the airwaves, as he loves to do, and he said, quote, everyone will need to get a yearly COVID shot for the rest of their lives. And I saw that, and I actually... I. <laughs> The first thought in my mind was, I am not everyone. I didn't get the first one. I didn't get a booster. I didn't get anything whatsoever. Same here. And and he is changing his tune with this, Kevin, quicker than weathermen change the forecast. I mean, I tried to go back and I tried to pull up some studies and I tried to pull up some headlines from months and years past now because we're going all the way back to 2020. I can't believe this much time has gone by. Um, and he started off January 2020, which is about two months or so before, um, you, you know, COVID hit the U.S. He said, COVID isn't something the American public needs to worry about. That's an exact quote. That's where we began with this. Now, you want to talk about 15. Yeah, make make the sound effect. I know you want to talk about the the shift. We went from something that the American public doesn't need to worry about to you need this shot for the rest of our lives. Um, he has repeatedly spewed lie after lie after lie. And if he what if you want to kind of take the route, like, oh, well, he's not really lying. He's just, you know, kind of going with the data that's being put out there and he's learning with, with, with the new information that's coming out. Okay, well, his tune has changed repeatedly. May 2020. So now we're two months into the virus. He came on uh, the news as he, again, he loves to do. And he said, this virus did not come from the Wuhan lab. That was a straight up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. right. Uh, take two. Okay, so now I've got, you know, this is not something that I need to worry about. To This is not coming from the Wuhan lab. June 2nd, 2021, emails leaked. I don't know if this was from our friend Julian Assange. But uh, he said in this email uh, that masks are not effective in keeping out the virus. Sound effect. Bum, bum, bum. Go for it. <laughs> well, actually, actually, I think I think he was right there. Actually, wait a second. Wait a second. Bing. There you go. Ping. Yeah, he, he, he yeah. hit that one on the head. 
we're, he makes this stuff up as he goes and and we're at the point i i don't know if we have um i don't have a headline in front of me but i think we can all a quick google search joe biden with the advice of you know these doctors especially fauci said if you had the covid vaccine you are not going to get covid so people were were thought to believe okay you know what i'm going to take this shot i'm protected and then as nature takes its course whatever variants form suddenly the original shot was no longer effective because the strand the protein strand is no longer um you know in the air you know infecting people the booster needs to come out they're preparing us now for the a yearly booster and where do you, i guess the question becomes is um do you think people are still falling for this i mean i think people are there are people i know people who, who they couldn't wait to line up for their third fourth fifth whatever booster shot do you think that they're not, you know, understanding that, hey, this isn't really effective in the numbers? And I think you have some studies or, or some, you know, research to show us, Kevin, that people are getting these shots and it's making them worse. What do you got? Oh, there. I mean, poof, where do I begin? I mean, I talked to a gal yesterday even here in Bavaria and, and she was she asked me, I was like, so, so just kind of offhand, were, were you vaccinated? And I said, no. And she's like, oh, no, I, I wasn't either. And keep in mind, she's she's speaking German, very, very thick Bavarian dialect. So mm. I didn't I, I'm understanding about 80 percent what she's saying. She's like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I, I didn't get vaccinated either. And we talked a little bit more. And she's like, and then, you know, we kept talking about the whole thing. I'm like, yeah, you know, I just didn't trust it. I, I wasn't sure about the science behind it. And I had covid. So I didn't feel like I needed to get the vaccine. And so and then we caught, talked a little bit more. And, and she eventually was like, yeah, in you know, my, my parents, they didn't want to get it, but I wanted to be an example to them. So I got it. So I got, I got one, two, and three, but I didn't get four. So I'm like, wait a second. I thought you weren't vaccinated, but she just meant she's not vaccinated with the last vaccine. You know, so it's like, she was vaccinated three times. And she said that she was negatively affected at least once when she got the vaccine, it made her really sick. And now she says, Nope, I'm done. I, I don't think it works. I think it's made me worse. And I don't, I, I'm not going to get any more. And that was really interesting that that this is a gal who was, you know, pro vaccines, pro COVID vaccines and has decided to go against it. And you can start looking into even countries starting to say, hey, we're not going to give this to anybody under 50. Now, this is an unconfirmed report mm -hmm. coming out of Denmark, but it's been reported. It's been spread by by people who are who are significant in the media, but it's it's debatable. But if you look in, apparently Denmark offers. They're starting to lose a little bit of faith in the vaccines because, well, um, it actually is more harmful than not. Now, that's just a rumor. I'm going to tell you something that is scary. This comes from a report on a study that comes from Harvard and Johns Hopkins, two of the top universities that study medicine or, or you know, any such thing. And, right. and this is this is this is <clears throat> taken from Children's Health Defense.org, but this is from the study um, from Harvard and Johns Hopkins. And quote, the 50 page study was published as a reprint on the Social Science Research Network at the end of August. The authors analyzed the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, and industry sponsored data on vaccine adverse events and concluded that mandating boosters in college students may cause 18 to 98 actual serious adverse events for each COVID-19 infection related hospitalization theoretically prevented. In other words, in other words, according to Harvard and Johns Hopkins, it is at least 18 times more likely to have a serious adverse event from the vaccine than it is from the COVID-19 infection. <clears throat> Bingo. There you go. And I, and I think that was my rationale. And I think that was a lot of people's rationale. Um, when when this was sort of developing, when this was sort of coming out, we were faced with two, two options here, right? You either, this is what they told us anyway, you get sick with the virus, or you get vaccinated with whatever this stuff is, and you're supposedly immune. Well, <laughs> the one thing that kind of, you know, really was a tipping point for me was reading uh, uh, an article that said, well, if, if I don't get vaccinated, then the odds of me suffering vaccine side effects logically are zero. And that was what I took. That was the risk that I took. I would 
rather get sick and deal with this because I feel like I'm healthy. I try my best as an Italian to eat well, uh, <laughs> uh, drink water, exercise. Do I trust my immune system to handle this? And that to me far outweighed getting this whatever shot into me with no long-term studies. We don't know, uh, you, you know, the effects of, of things that are out 50, 60, 70 years. We don't know long-term effects of this. This vaccine has been out for what a year, not even there's nothing on this. And we're starting to see, as you pointed out there, I guess you can call it the fruit of it. Um, we're seeing what's, what's going on. We're seeing the reaction to this. And I can't help but wonder, I, if this isn't a, a coordinated effort here, um, to kind of back to Democrats original um, platform for, for election in 2020 uh, on October 30th, 2020 Kamala Harris, this was on her Twitter account. She said, quote, Donald Trump still does not have a plan to defeat coronavirus. Joe Biden and I do. Uh, they have to show that they're doing something. I think they have, and, and their solution is uh, admittedly as Trump's sadly is the vaccine. And this yearly booster, this perpetual shot that you need for the rest of your life, seems to be the um, the solution to it. This is how we are combating and defeating the coronavirus. But what's what's biting them is the numbers that you just said, is the data is not on their side to prevent, not only prevent sickness, but actually make you sicker and i don't know if maybe anybody again in the comments would want to chime in if they have any you know did anybody here maybe who's listening take the vaccine did they suffer these effects i used to take the flu shot years ago i was guaranteed to get sick from the flu shot i never caught the, i don't know if i ever caught the actual flu in my life i would get the flu shot and be out two days and even that alone kind of i don't get it anymore because of that but that alone was was an eyebrow raiser to me and the studies that you just said kevin like wow um the data is starting to show and it's not good. Well, well, and, and this is my, my take on it. And I don't want people who got the vaccine to, to feel like we're throwing them under the bus. That's not the point. I, I'm sure, sure. A, anyone who got it is probably regretting it now. I, I think that's just a simple truth. And I, I, I am sincerely, sincerely hopeful that it is not as bad as I think it could be because I have many loved ones who did get the vaccine. And I certainly right. hope that it is just something that may make you a little bit ill or maybe it's slightly more dangerous. Truly, I truly hope that. But I really think this is something that goes deeper than this. And I think it goes down to the medical establishment and this, mm. this worship of, yeah. of the elite, the, the worship of experts, the worship of humanism. Now, don't get me wrong. My life has been saved by medical doctors. I, I had my appendix burst. If it was not for a doctor, I would be dead period. Mm. I also cut my finger in half. A doctor brilliantly sewed it up and my fingers work pretty much perfectly now. So again, I'm not against the medical establishment, but what I'm against is the deification of doctors and the medical elite. And this has been the case for hundreds of years that the doctors always say, yep, we know everything. We've got it all figured out. We, we know we, we have science in the palm of our hands and we've got it under control. And you know what? They're about 20% right. And that's been this case for hundreds of years. And every generation does it. Every generation thinks they have all the answers and every generation is wrong. So people, mm. I'm not saying don't go to the doctor. That's not at all what I'm saying, but don't treat them like they're infallible because they're not. Yeah, uh, same with me. Uh, myself and others included, I know who th really their lives have been saved by doctors, by medical experts, by science. So yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, the technology we have with robots performing surgery has done things that um, have have completely changed the scope. I mean, I, a cousin of mine we lost in uh, 1996, um, and we were basically told that. If if he if the, if what was going on in the mid '90s was happening today, he would have been cured. Uh, so again, the, the the leaps and bounds here, yes, absolutely. But um, to another point is, as you said, there is money talks. <laughs> Who's paying for these yearly vaccines? Where we just you know shove it out to everybody? Trillions. Um, who's tr right? Of course, there's there's trillions, not millions, not billions, trillions of dollars in this business. Why in the world would you want a cure? 
you've got money making machines here. These people are raking it in. They have the support of the federal government. They have the support of world leaders across the globe. Um, they are piping money. And these people are getting their pockets filled. These people are getting their th these people are getting their lives set. Uh, they don't want it to end. And sadly, money talks. Well, and 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 don't listen to me or Matt. We're not doctors, and, and we sincerely don't know the effects of the vaccine or the effects of not getting it. So, do find a doctor that you trust. Find someone that you you know is going to tell you the best of what what they can find out. That's all you can do, right? And and I understand that. We understand that. So. You got to take things, you know. I guess with a grain of salt. Go with your, you know, your best efforts into it, and find a doctor that you trust. Just please, 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 don't trust it blindly, because we are seeing again with studies, even from Harvard and Johns Hopkins, that it is dangerous for young people to take it. Please take that to heart, study it yourselves, find a doctor you trust, and make the right decision. So we are going to head now to a fantastic interview with. Mario Dirksen, also known as Nova Soto Watch, where he gives us all the juicy details of what went on with Bergoglio, that is, quote unquote, Pope Francis in Kazakhstan. Now, when we recorded this, it was supposed to be 20 minutes long. And thanks to Mario's incredible knowledge on the topic and his eloquence, we went to about 70 minutes. So we've kind of crammed the best parts into this 20 minutes, but the rest of the interview will be published on Tuesday. So be sure to check that out and listen to the shorter version coming up next. The man, the myth, the legend, Mario Dirksen, also known as Nova Soto Watch, who of course is really probably the best person in the world to discuss this matter. And before we get going, I have to, I can't recommend enough for everybody to go out and follow him on Twitter, follow him on Facebook, Nova Soto Watch, and of course, go and check out his website at novasotowatch.org. He's, he's pretty much covering this step-by-step -step as it goes, and then also writing in-depth blogs about this matter and all sorts of ecclesiology and theology, etc. It's fantastic. Go follow him. Go check it out. Mario, what on earth is going on in Kazakhstan? Hi, Kevin. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, it was uh, quite an event. The seventh Congress of Leaders of World and Traditional Religions uh, convened in the capital of Nur Sultan, which until 2019 was known as Astana. And uh, this capital already is um, absolutely bizarre because it has been called the Illuminati capital of the world. And uh, when you look at it, when you look at the, the skyline and the buildings, the bizarre architecture, it just screams Freemasonry and, uh, you know, Illuminatiism and occultism. Um, but that's uh, secondary to, uh, you know, what actually took place. So in uh, one of the uh, strange buildings in Astana or in Nur Sultan is the Pyramid. Okay, there is actually a pyramid that was built, I believe, in 2003 specifically for interreligious purposes. It is called the Palace of Peace and Reconciliation. And at the top of that pyramid, there is a huge round table at which, uh, you know, delegates uh, from these world and traditional religions gather, uh, I believe it's every few years, and this time was the first time that the supposed Pope, the head of the Vatican II Church, uh, decided to participate. And so we knew from the outset that this was going to be a huge event and uh, have great significance. And, you know, he begins his opening address uh, by talking about, you know, how uh, he is addressing them all. And this is a quote now in the name of the fraternity that unites us as children of the same heaven unquote okay i mean th this is just garbage it's just uh, it's just utter garbage what what, what is what what does that mean first of all um it, what same heaven are we talking about how is everybody there a child of heaven um if you know anything about original sin which we're all uh conceived into with the exception of course of our blessed mother um if you know anything about original sin, you know that we're children of wrath by nature, by fallen human nature. 
And it is through baptism, through sanctifying grace, through faith, hope, and charity that we become children of God, right? This is why there was a redemption. Our Lord had to redeem us from the devil. He had to purchase us back from the dominion that, uh, the, the, the dominion of Satan that we were under, right? And that's what happens at baptism. That's why you have these exorcism prayers and, uh, and that. So uh, to, to begin by calling everybody um, a child of heaven, of the same heaven, is all very is already extremely problematic. Now I'm sure you know that one of Fran I'm, I'm sure some of Francis's apologists could you know find some way to wiggle themselves out of that, or rather wiggle him out of that. Um, but this is a consistent theme with Francis, right? Everybody is a child of God, and um, especially in an interreligious assembly like that, you can't just you can't just say that because it communicates. The, the wrong idea. Now, it is true that we're, you can understand the phrase child of God in a natural sense, but um, that's not like enough because that it doesn't end there. Like the fact that is our creator, obviously God created all of us e equally in the, in the sense that we all share the same nature. Um, that's only, that's, that's true, but that's only part of the truth. Um, because if we remain just that, if we remain just in our natural fallen state, we will go to hell. And then it well, doesn't and, and, matter. Right. Go and sorry, it, it just seems like the, it's just incredible that you have to have spin doctors for the, the supposed pope who have to go out and try to dig him out of apostasy. I, I mean, it's, it's just unbelievable. And I think that for me, you get this yeah. just a smell test, the eye test. And it's just simply when you, as you said, exactly as you say, if he's in this group of other religions and he's saying we're all children of heaven, that's just, that's saying that everyone is equally on the same path to heaven. It, that's, yes. it doesn't even begin to, I mean, it's like, come on, a 10 year old should be able to see this. What is going on? Yes. And, and, you know, and of course, Francis is tying heaven to our nature as if it were owed or if, as if it were a matter, like if, if the destiny of heaven were a matter of our uh, of our nature, but simply by being human, you are a child of heaven and you're going there. That's heresy, right? That's right. naturalism. Um, and so in fact, it is the, 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 um, the vocation we all have to the beatific vision is something that is not due to our nature, but is added to our nature. It's supernatural. And that is something that God uh, did not have to do. He did not have to create us uh, for the sake of heaven. He chose to do that out of love. It is gratuitous love. Um, and uh, that, of course, is completely denied here. And that is the common thread throughout all of Francis's uh, addresses, at least whenever it comes to interreligious audiences or interreligious contexts. See, Francis preaches different things depending on who he's preaching to. Okay, so yeah, he will talk about he will talk about Catholic things with Catholic, right? Or the right who think they're Catholics. Um, he does that, but then he turns around and then addresses an interreligious audience. And it's not that there's a shift of emphasis. Simply, it's not that oh he tweaks this or that, or because obviously yes, you you know if you're if you're talking to non-Catholics, you you can't say the exact same thing you would talk to a you, you would tell a Catholic because they're not going to understand. But Fundamentally, it can be a different gospel. It cannot be a different thing. And that is exactly what Francis is doing. He preaches different things to different people. That is why I believe it was last year he got in trouble with the Jews because the Jews caught on. The Jews caught on that, that he's preaching um, to Catholics that um, uh, the, the old Mosaic law is over and doesn't save. Well, the Jews said, well, excuse me, uh, that's not what you told us. <laughs> Okay, and then there, there was a bit of a yeah diplomatic problem there because then they got letters uh, the from it was Cardinal Kurt uh, Koch, um, who is the chief ecumenist, and you know don't ask me why, but in the Vatican, the ecumenical office also includes relations with the Jews. Okay, that does not that is not grouped under interreligious dialogue. It's grouped under the unity of Christians. I I don't know why, but curious, isn't it? So Koch was was approached by I think it was the chief rabbi of Jerusalem, and then I think a rabbi in New York, and they basically said, "Hey, listen, what Francis said there at one of his 
I think it was an Angelus address or no, it was the Wednesday audit because he was he was preaching on the St. Paul's letter to the Galatians. And yeah, I mean, if you think the Mosaic law is over, excuse me, if you think the Mosaic law is still in effect, you got to read Galatians, also Romans. Um, but but so they heard him. So they heard Francis preach about that. And they're saying, well, excuse me, the, the, how can you say the Mosaic law is is over? And then, um, so they had a diplomatic uh, snafu on their hands, and uh, it, it was uh, they essentially ended up by saying, "Well, um, the old the old law is salvific for the Jews, something like that." I it's all on the blog. I covered it all. I I don't have the exact um, wording now, but essentially, you know, they always like to make an exception for the Jews, which is such a great disservice. Uh, to them, I mean, it's obviously an offense against God, and it's it's heresy, but it's also very uncharitable towards the Jews to act as though our Lord Jesus Christ were not their Savior. If you read the Gospel, our Lord's mission was to the Jews first and foremost. He almost never spoke with Gentiles. There's only a few instances um, where our Lord actually spoke with Gentiles. Almost all of it was the Jews, and he specifically told them, if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sin. So w whenever the, these Vatican uh, bureaucrats uh, deny that the Jews have to convert, they're essentially saying you can stay in your sin and go to hell, is what they're saying. So well, it's, 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 his, it's Francis's it's his message of no proselytizing, right? Don't, don't go teach someone the faith, for goodness sake. Don't try to bring them to, to the Catholic way. Yes, yes. And and nowhere is that more clear and, and more firmly implanted than with regard to the Jews. That is very, very sad and completely unacceptable. Um, now, in his opening address, not only did Francis talk about, you know, fraternity and children of heaven, and all that, he also said the following. So this is a quote. God is peace. He guides us always in the way of peace, never that of war. Let us commit ourselves then even more to insisting on the need for resolving conflicts, not by the inconclusive means of power with arms and threats, but by the only means blessed by heaven and worthy of men, encounter, dialogue, and patient negotiations, which make progress, especially when they take into consideration the young and future generations, unquote. Okay, so um, Francis believes that a conflict-free world is possible through encounter, dialogue, and negotiation, okay? That man does not believe in original sin or its consequences. That's clear. Because a conflict-free world, aside from Jesus Christ, the King, is impossible. That doesn't mean we can't use, you know, natural means as well to aid in, obviously we want peace, we don't want war. But the, it's simply false and scandalous to say that the only means blessed by heaven to obtain peace are uh, encounter, dialogue, and negotiation. Those are natural means. There's nothing there about grace or about the gospel. So it is a, a fundamental principle of the gospel that supernatural assistance is needed for, for man to overcome sin. Because let's face it, all, all war, all conflict, all of that is the result of sin. It always goes back to that. You know, we're, we're talking about, you know, things like pride, envy, greed, right? Covetousness, uh, lust for power, et cetera. These are all sins. And in order to overcome sin, we need God's grace. We need God's help. Without that, encounter dialogue and negotiations aren't going to uh, result in the desired world peace. So Francis is completely ignoring that, and instead he preaches a different gospel, that of naturalism. I call it the gospel of man. And right? it He's, makes me it makes me wonder just to try to get into his head for a second and just wonder what he actually, what does he actually think God is? I, I honestly wonder. I mean, I I don't know. I wonder if he knows or if he has an actual idea. Yes, I. It's it's very hard um, to even. But see, Bishop Sanborn, for example, thinks he's an atheist. That Golio is an atheist. 
he thinks that he doesn't believe in God, which I think is is a reasonable conclusion that this is just kind of uh, he just says these things um, and ultimately doesn't believe in God. I could Th- buy that, it. I, yeah, that uh, he certainly acts like like somebody like that. Um, so you know, he's he's trying to promote the good of humanity. And this is really, again, if you go back to what the, the, the topic was, the role of leaders of world and traditional faiths in the socio-spiritual development of humanity after the pandemic, <laughs> uh, they're all trying to promote the good of humanity without taking into account the spiritual welfare of man, okay? The authentic spiritual welfare. Now, that, that um, a Buddhist or a Hindu wouldn't wouldn't understand that or wouldn't have the correct ideas about that is understood but that the man who claims to be the pope of the catholic church wouldn't understand that that is very troubling because man's authentic spiritual welfare has to do with faith hope and charity okay and when we say faith we don't mean oh uh, people believing something about god no we're talking about the actual virtue of faith, the readiness uh, that that uh, a man can have to assent firmly to what God has revealed, because God, who cannot deceive and cannot make a mistake, has revealed it with God's assistance. Because God's assistance, a God's assistance, is required for the virtue of faith. You cannot simply will to believe. You, you must, God must enable you to believe. So um, faith is, is the fundamental virtue uh, that you must have, uh, you know, to be saved. It's not sufficient, uh, but you cannot have hope and charity, hope or charity without faith. You can have faith without charity, but you cannot have charity without faith. So there is no... Um, Ultimately, there is good of humanity without uh, uh, taking the, the their spiritual welfare into account. So, but that's what they're trying to do. See, and they're tr- and they're they're doing it in in a way that um, they're trying to to come up with a kind of generic religion of transcendence. And you can you can see it in in all these statements. Francis kept talking about the Creator. He didn't say he didn't say the most holy trinity. He didn't say Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He certainly didn't use the holy name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He did at the cathedral because that there he's got a different audience. But when it comes to the interreligious congress, there's not Francis is not preaching the gospel, right? He's not there to preach the gospel and say, everybody here, listen to me. This is the truth. This is the only way. Jesus Christ is the only way to um uh, 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 humanity's happiness. No, he just, it's lowest common denominator. I guess they could all somehow agree on there being a creator. And I don't even want to know what a creator is, uh, what, what, what kind of an idea of a creator a Hindu has. Okay. Or maybe, um, uh, I don't know, a, a voodoo practitioner or, uh, somebody like that. So, it's ultimately the preaching and indifferentism where it doesn't really matter what you believe because all religions are, you know, more or less good and praiseworthy. All religions lead to salvation or at least lead or, or can lead to human happiness. And that's simply, that's heresy, right? That's, that's false. Mario, you are, you are the best, the best in the business right here. I really appreciate it. I, I really appreciate you coming on and, and letting us know what what is going on and 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 your continual work in doing so again on social media and on your blog which everyone should follow especially anyone who has doubts and has questions about francis and about the nova Soto. mario will eventually convince you that it cannot be the catholic church and again the next steps we can help you with as well if you need it mario Thank last words much. Uh, I just would like to recommend also my podcast, uh, Tratcast, and uh, it exists in two editions. There's Tratcast and there's Tratcast Express. You can access both of them at tradcast.org. And I thank Perfect. everybody for listening. Hope it was helpful. And, and, 
and go go listen to these podcasts that they're awesome i i, I learn a lot from from mario and and from his editing skills because boy if anyone <laughs> watches these shows they, they learn that there's not a whole lot of editing that goes on now now mario's he, he even has sound effects in his and stuff that's something that uh, oh yeah one Those one of these days it. mario <laughs> they're, they're so good <laughs> I, I i know i know that that matt also looks forward to to your tradcast every time you publish them and and i'm sure you got good stuff coming out uh, again for for covering this whole craziness but um again thanks so much mario I, I hope to have you on again next time there's some congress of leaders of world and traditional religions uh hopefully no time <laughs> no time too soon but until then right. god bless you god bless thanks and we are back and well after talking a little bit of uh faith and in, in church politics and apostasy uh we want to talk uh, again about a little bit more of a cultural topic with matt and we want to talk about the drop the severe drop and decline of the marriage and birth rates around the world. And before we get into any of the data, I don't know, Matt, do you have, do you have any opening comments on that? I, I think you're not married, Matt. I don't know if you're one proper to no. discuss this topic. Uh, no, I, I'm not. Gotta, gotta, um, so Got to find you a wife. Any ladies out there? <laughs> no, right. Right, right, right. Any, <laughs> anyone with... <listening>? Right. <laughs> Perhaps I think I think very very much perhaps, um, yeah. I, I mean, talking about marriage rate, birth rate, the numbers are plummeting, and I think you know when you and I were kind of chatting off off air here, Kevin, and we were kind of saying, you know, what do we want to talk about? And we brought this up, and I was like, you know what? I think everything ties together. That was the original thought that I had. I, I remember I was driving home uh, the other day from work and just thinking about this, and I was like, you know. Natural law is on every man's heart. Divine providence governs everything. And the way um, our world is turning away from God, the more we are inclined to turn away from things that are of God, and one of them being the sacrament of matrimony and children. And so I thought, you know, I think with the... Um, introduction of uh, contraception in the 60s, abortion, cohabitation, all of these are, are little jabs, I guess you can call them, that, that chip away at the purpose of marriage, right? Because if you look at what's the actual purpose of marriage, what does the church teach? The, 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 the goal of marriage is to help your spouse get to heaven, of course, to sanctify each other and to have, be fruitful, have, have children. Once I am taught or told that, you know, children are kind of a burden, you, you know, I can have an abortion if I want, I should contracept. Well, suddenly the, the, the means of all this marriage is suddenly not so important anymore. It used to be, you know, I want to have a family. I want to have children. I want to care for and provide for my spouse and my kids. Uh, what do I do? I get married. <laughs> That's just how, you know, natural law kind of governs itself. Um, and now we're having... An inverse. People are on contraception at I don't know what rates. Um, abortion is is completely throwing the child out of the picture. And then once we remove the child from marriage, we've got a problem. And now we're being pumped. I pulled up some articles. Um, the Atlantic, just I think it, it, the newspaper, The Atlantic, just two years ago, they had this headline. And this is an actual headline, word for word. What becoming a parent really does to your happiness. Research has found that having children listen to this, is terrible for your quality of life. Following a following headline. This is another one. This is another newspaper headline. Um, uh, children are making you unhappy. That's another headline. So we're, we're being told, we're being really brainwashed that children are a burden. I can contracept. I can have abortions. They're, I, they make me unhappy. They ruin my quality of life. I don't want kids. Once I remove that from the picture, maybe marriage looks a little bit less attractive to me. I don't want to marry. I don't need to marry. Um, and I think it all kind of spirals into that. It's all rooted, again, in sin. These things that I mentioned, contraception, abortion, cohabitation, we're speaking of sin. And once I kind of dwell in this and live in this sin, you know, just glow in this sin 
the rest becomes meaningless. Well, and I'm going to take it even a step back because you're sure. totally right. I mean, I agree with everything you're saying. I'm just going to take yeah, it a sure. step back because I want to take it back to a topic we talked about last week, and that is Disney. And I think mm. Disney has for decades instilled in our young people, in our children, the idea that I am what matters. Me first. Everything is me. I, I am the princess. I am the prince. And I should get whatever I want. I, I don't need the world to tell me what I what I should do. I don't want responsibilities. I don't want a family. I want to go and have adventure. And I want to go. And, and I mean, you, you think that these are really simple and they're really innocent. They're not. They're not. There's no morals to them. Go and look at Disney, at least for the last decades. There's no morality. There's no, they're not trying to teach you something. They're not trying to help kids to learn a, a moral or a virtue they are trying to tell them that you are what matters and this this actually has an impact and it had an impact on me when, when i grew up into you know past my teenage years i went into the world thinking what do i want to do you know literally what's my dream what's my disney prince dream hmm. And so I went in and I, I, I went to school for, for sports broadcasting and, and, you know, okay, I have a podcast now, so I guess it's, it's done some good, but it's not very realistic. And so I spent, I spent money, I spent time and I couldn't find any work and, and I don't have very many skills, et cetera. And this is a big problem in society. Just speaking of, you know, terms of finding work and, and people getting degrees for absolutely nothing, but it also has an impact on getting married and it has an impact on boys and girls, men and women thinking again, they have this idea of, of being a princess. And what, what is my, what, is, and, and a prince, what is my dream? What, what is the thing I want to do most? I want to go and have an education and, and learn. I want to study to be a, a history major, a, a French middle, middle of the 15th century French major. And then I'm going to travel the world. And, and then I'm going to blah, 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 blah until they're 35. And then they're like, Oh shoot. Oh shoot. <laughs> Now, now I really want to have kids. And you know what? Maybe I'll have one. And this is the truth of it. And you can look up studies. But I, I pulled up a study from usnews.com. And they say in 2018, the rate of marriages fell to 6.5 or fell 6.5%. Okay, wait a second. I got to read this. From 1982 to 2009, marriage rates fell fairly steadily and then hovered around 6.8 to 7 per 1,000 through 2017. Okay, I don't understand the numbers at all. See, this is the issue when you start getting mathematics into a podcast for me. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but anyway, yeah, I, the, the data has severely uh, shrunk in the last years for, for yes. people willing to get married. Yeah, and I think I um, I wanted to ask your opinion on this too, Kevin. And again, maybe as I have said before, people can chime in. Um, dating versus courtship has changed. Um, and somebody pointed at a, a real twist or a real pivot, I guess you can call it, in this pattern um, actually has to do with cars, um, travel. Dating kind of coincides with the invention of the automobile. I don't know how true this is. I heard somebody talking about this. I could be totally wrong. Please, somebody correct me if I am. But um, it was pretty common, you know, back then, somebody in your neighborhood, somebody in your village, you see her, him, whatever you match up. Okay, we're just going to court, see if we're compatible, and then we're just going to marry. And then sort of dating with, you know, now we, we, we are going on trips, we're going out to restaurants, we're going out to do things, we're, we're driving, we're traveling, we're, we're all these things. And it kind of changed the dynamic of how men and women come together, um, realize if they're compatible or not and just marry and so i don't know if you have anything you want to add to that but do you think oh, uh, that where do i start yeah 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 go, go, go. <laughs> well, i mean go, uh, how much time it. do we have i mean here's the here's what i really think happens too especially with the internet and you're totally right i think it started with a car <clears throat> and now we're it's in a catastrophic degree with with social media and the internet and this is what happens part of it part of the issue is that you you have two people that say they go on a date they go and have coffee and you know it's pretty okay it's pretty nice heck maybe it's great you know what happens? They instinctively think, oh, but I've got 2,000 Twitter followers. There's got to be somebody. I'm <laughs> sure there's somebody who's perfect. Now, this is great. Mm. This is really good. But there's someone better, I bet. And, and it's this whole expectation. And, and it's an unrealistic expectation of I can find something better. And this is something that, that goes throughout society, not just with dating. I've had issues where I, I invite people to a party and they'll say, uh, mm -hmm. we can't RSVP yet because we're not sure if something will come up. I'm like, what do you think is going to come up? A better party? 
I mean, I'm right. serious. It's like, what, what, what's your point? I mean, just tell me yes or no. What, what's going to come up? And that's the same thing with, with these with these dating issues. Like, oh, yeah, you're really nice. You're a great Catholic guy. You're pretty good looking. You have a good job. But then they fill in the blank. And it's 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 a problem with both sexes. I think primarily with women, but men too. Men's More than men's problem is just being man enough to ask a girl out, honestly. Men, men have become women when it turn, in terms of mm. dating. And, and women have just become, well, no, there's too many options. You know, I, I can go on the internet and there's this guy I chatted on Facebook and he is so cute. Oh my <laughs> goodness. And they don't know anything about it. They never met him, but they know it's a possibility. So you're totally, I totally agree with you that it started with, with the car and it expanded this horizon of possibility. And, and this is a topic, again, I could talk about forever because I think it's, it's a huge issue with society in general, even with work back in the day. If, I, if my dad was a blacksmith, I my, the likelihood of me being a blacksmith was pretty good. If I wasn't a blacksmith, okay, mm. then I'd be a farmer or I'd be a soldier, etc. You had about 10 choices, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Now I've got about a thousand. And you know what? It stinks. It absolutely yeah. stinks because most people either make the wrong choice or don't make a choice at all. Yeah, yeah. I, I do think, though, I agree with all that you said. And I think just the dynamics between the two people, the two sexes has, has changed dramatically from where we were even 100 years ago. I mean, um, just actually a quick story, if I, if I can share. Um, you know, I, this is what I've heard. I could be wrong, but m the way my grandparents met. So my grandparents were born in 21, 1921 and 1926. And my grandfather used to deliver milk. And um, so he would get up in the morning, he would grab his, his, his barrel or whatever that he had of all the jars of milk to deliver to the doors. And um, he was maybe 20 at the time. And um, one of the houses was my grandmother. And he noticed, you know, this beautiful young Italian girl, 18 or so at the home and caught his, caught his eye, of course. And um, he basically said, I'm going to marry her. I, you know, I, I love her and I want to marry. And I think back then, and I think what we're, if I can kind of maybe take a little bit of approach from what different approach from what you're saying is a good thing about Twitter and all these social media outlets is it's hard to find like-minded people nowadays. Whereas back then in this neighborhood where I, you know, where my family grew up and all of that, um, for the most part, everyone was Italian. Everyone was Catholic and there was no feminism yet. So it, this was easy. I have a, a young woman here who's Italian. She's can cook for me, which is the plus. Um, she's a Catholic. Everybody here was just Catholic at the time. And, uh, you know, what's feminism? So, you know, I, I think that made it very easy. Like, you know what? Now I'm going to marry her. Today, you've got to weed all this stuff out. You've got to, you know, what, you know, how Catholic are you? Um, do you embrace feminism? There's so many things that now we have to weed out that wasn't the case before. You find somebody, you marry her because it's just what women were. Um, and sure enough, he did. So he married her. And I, I want to say he was 21 and she was 19 at the time of their wedding. Again, very common. Um, but now with social media is you get to know people um, that you might not have access to where you are, especially our position of state of occultism. It's very hard to connect with people unless you're making an hour long trip, or whatever, to maybe a chapel that might be small, might have 30 people who attend it. Um, you can really expand with, with Twitter, find people with like ideas, find people with good um, morals, with the same a belief set of beliefs that you have and so i i see both of it i, I do think that there is some good because you know it, it weeds out you know a lot of the quote-unquote bad or other things that you don't want so i see both sides of it but the way times have shifted from just 100 years ago where you can pretty much bet that a girl was going to be skilled in doing you know household feminine sort of things to now who knows you know women don't want that and it's and it's changed a lot there's another podcast in the works with uh, Stephen Spray, who's going to go on a podcast. The plan is for him to go on a podcast with four women to discuss mm. his interpretation of feminism. It's going to be great. It's, it's going to be one of the best shows of all nice. time. I, I can't wait for it because anyone who knows Stephen Spray, he does not mince words. But uh, with four women on the show right. or three three women on the show, he, he, he uh, might have to. Be, he might. I'm, I'm, he might I'm, have I'm, to. I'm, I, I, and Stephen has done it. He's done a podcast with with the Diamond Brothers. So, uh, and I told him, I think this is gonna be this is gonna be harder. This is gonna be a harder challenge than that. But, but, <laughs> but I do think. I mean, it is it is a it is a significant issue. And I think you're right that that it does it does help to get to know people. But I think it's it's both sides, as you say. I mean, it's good to get to yeah. know people. But then once you meet someone, 
pull the trigger. You know, I mean, I mean, don't be so scared of pulling the trigger and then don't be so scared. If you're a guy, that's how I met my wife. I did. I did first see my wife on Facebook. This is, this is true. I saw her mm -hmm. on Facebook. I'm like, wow. Okay. She's pretty. And then I saw, oh, wow. She's coming to America. So you know what? I'm going to go find any way possible to go see her. And I did, did a road trip to California from Colorado, went and met her and I was like, okay, yep going to marry her and then i chased her around the world wow. until she did and so it did start on social media but it was like okay you know what this is the girl like, like like your grandpa you know this is the girl i want to marry you know and this is it you know and and i think that's that's i think it does have to be somewhere in between you're totally right that you can find really good groups and good people on sure. social media and terrible people as well yeah, <laughs> but sure but but sure. go and make they, make they something follow happen. me <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Go, go, go and make something happen. Don't just sit around and, 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 and hope that something better is going to come because it's not. And you're going to end up being 35 years old and you're going to contribute to to the lack of children in society, which is yeah. far, far more dangerous than anything else happening in the world right now that nobody's talking about. Nobody's talking about the lack of babies. And I can tell you right now in Germany, it's a great example that we have far, far more old people and we have immigrants neither of which contributes to society. Old people, it's fine. They contributed their share already, but there are fewer and fewer babies, which means in a generation, maybe two, the entire system, the entire structure of Germany will fail. It will, it must, because there are not gonna be enough people to work to support the old people. And that's the, that's the issue when, well, we stop having babies. We stop having families. We stop doing God's will. And we stop doing what God planned for us to do and have family. So if you're out there listening to this, I know it's not super easy to find a wife. We're going to find a Matt a wife after this show. So anyone who's interested, <laughs> send me send me an email. I'm, I'm going to hook you up with Matt right away. He's somewhere in the Northeastern United States. So he, he is willing to drive. I, I, at least that's what he's told me. He's, he's willing to drive. And, and he's a great cook. So he'll, he'll come and cook you some pasta. Oh, the best. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're going to get... We're gonna get we Not working on a on a, we'll, on a family here soon. We'll do a cooking show one day, Kevin. Perfect. You and I live footage, yes. Emerald Lagasse Food Network. Yes, that's, <laughs> sounds good. Uh, it sounds good. Well, and that's a good way to to end this segment. Matt is going to take us next and end the show as well with the final segment of the show. He's going to bring us back into theology, and uh, we'll do a little bit of a solo segment. So stay tuned that's and. Right. Hear Matt out here coming up next after this short break. Hey guys, what if having your finances in order actually could make you a better Catholic? What if it allowed you to give more, to be more generous, to tithe on a regular basis, to not be stressed about money in your marriage? At Dan Kramer Inc., we teach people how to organize and structure their finances to recover cost, to lower their risk, and to actually have a plan that they're comfortable with to win this game of finances. And it's not just to have a big pile of money, but to allow you to actually do the things that you want to do. Many of my clients are Catholics, and they find that they can focus on what's actually important, like their faith and their family and their fitness and not have to worry so much about the finances. I, I hope this helps you. And I hope if you have any questions at all, reach out to Dan at Dan Kramer Inc. or Ben, and we'd love to have a conversation with you. Welcome you. back to Mornings with Matt and Kevin. We are sedificantists, which means we don't claim to be more Catholic than the Pope. We believe that the chair of Peter has been vacant since the death of Pope Pius XII in 1958, and that the religion being promulgated upon us by the Vatican II Church is not the Catholic religion founded by Jesus Christ. So thank you for joining me, and let's get right to it. Recently, an interview with Mr. Athanasius Schneider, who goes by the title of Bishop, has made its way around Twitter circles this week. The interview is from 2017, but Mr. Schneider has some interesting things to say about obedience to the Pope, but we'll look at that in just a bit. I wanted to start off by reviewing some basic terms. Oftentimes, 
you hear the word heresy thrown around Twitter circles and the like, but what exactly is heresy? What makes one a heretic? Let's look for the answer in the Baltimore Catechism. Quote, Heretics are those who were baptized and who claim to be Christians, but do not believe all the truths our Lord has taught. They accept only a portion of the doctrine of Christ and reject the remainder, and hence they become rebellious children of the church. They belong to the true church, being baptized and all, but do not submit to its teaching, and therefore are outcast children, disinherited till they return to the true faith. In contrast, a schismatic is one who believes everything the church teaches, but will not submit to the authority of its head, the Holy Father. Such persons do not long remain only schismatics, for they rise up against the authority of the church. They soon reject some of its doctrines and thus become heretics. And indeed, since Vatican Council I, all schismatics are heretics. That's the Baltimore Catechism of Volume 4, paragraph 323. In his 1943 encyclical, Mystici Corporis Christi, Pope Pius XII writes, quote, For not every sin, however grave it may be, is such as of its own nature to sever a man from the body of the church, as to schism or heresy or apostasy. That's paragraph 23, Mystici Corporis Christi, Pope Pius XII. The Holy Father makes it clear. Not every sin separates man from being a member of the church, but only those of heresy, schism, and apostasy. So, if those are the sins that cut man off from the church, who then are the church's members? What makes one a member of this mystical body of Christ? Pope Pius XII answers this question in the same encyclical, paragraph 22, where he says, quote, Actually, only those are to be included as members of the church who have been baptized and profess the true faith, and who have not been so unfortunate as to separate themselves from the unity of the body, end quote. The heretic does not profess the true faith, since he, as the Baltimore Catechism points out, accepts only portions of the doctrine of Christ and does not believe all the truths the church has taught. The Baltimore Catechism continues, quote, The denial of only one article of faith will make a person a heretic and guilty of mortal sin. Because the Holy Scripture says, Whoever shall keep the whole law, but offend it in one point, is become guilty of all. That's Lesson 30, Paragraph 1171. Therefore, we know, a person who denies even one article of faith could not be a Catholic. Draw your conclusions. We're going to take a small break, but when we come back, you'll want to hear what Mr. Schneider says of the attitude Catholics should have towards the Pope and how it stacks up against the real teachings of the Church. We'll be right back. You're listening to Monday Mornings with Matt and Kevin. Thank you, and please continue to support the Catholic Family Podcast. We are Sedificantists, which means that we are not more Catholic than the Pope. Welcome back in. Speaking of being more Catholic than the Pope, Mr. Athanasius Snyder 
also known to the Novus Order world as Bishop Schneider, has figured out how to explain this, what he calls, crisis in the church by telling Catholics to stop being so attached to the Pope. Yeah, you heard that right. Here, take a listen. And so maybe this crisis, which are now we are, we are experiencing, helped in the church to be more balanced in the attitude towards the Pope, to, to avoid this extreme uh, papalatria and divinization of the Pope, and to allow in the church, in some way also, a uh, respectful and loving uh, possibility to make an appeal to the Holy Father when there is really a danger. Okay, let me read it back to you. Quote, The crisis which we are now experiencing will help the Church be more balanced in its attitude towards the Pope and to avoid this extreme, unhealthy, papal tree and divinization of the Pope when there is an objective danger to the common good of the church. Close quote. <laughs> Did you get that? There is this unhealthy attachment towards the Pope, especially since he is, you know, putting the church in danger and stuff. Rather than hearing me comment on this statement, why don't I let past popes answer this ridiculous claim. Pope St. Pius X, quote, When we love the Pope, we do not dispute what he commands or requires or seek to know where the obligation of obedience lies or in what matters we must obey. For where there is holiness, there cannot be disagreement with the Pope. The same Pius X also writes, quote, All the strength of the Church is in the Pope. All the foundations of our faith are based on the successor of Peter. Those who wish her ill assault the papacy cut themselves adrift from the Church. They make the Pope an object of hatred and contempt. End quote. How about Pius XII? Quote, the Pope has the divine promises. Even in his human weaknesses, he is invincible and unshakable. Messenger of truth, the principle of unity in the church. His voice denounces errors, idolatry, superstition. It condemns iniquity and makes charity and virtue loved. Lastly, Pius IX, quote, Remember, ellipsy, the words which Christ said of himself, He that gathers with me not scatters, can be applied to the Roman pontiff, who holds the place of God on earth. Ground your whole wisdom, therefore, in an absolute obedience and constant adherence to this chair. Closed quote. So, yeah, let's stop this unhealthy attachment Catholics have towards the Pope. Right. Ultramontanism for the win. You've been listening to the Catholic Family Podcast. If you enjoyed this show, please share it with your friends and family. You can support the production on Patreon and PayPal, and you can reach Kevin at kevin89davis at gmail.com. At Majorum Dei Gloriam, all for the greater glory of God.